Hey everyone and welcome to Co Blueprint. I am Jeanette Mulvey, the Content Director of Co by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Today we are going to talk about how to run a safe and socially distant business. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We know this is a really challenging time for small businesses, and we created this entire series to help you rebuild your business and come out of this better and stronger than ever on the other side. Each week, we bring you small business experts and owners to share their insights and their strategies for doing just that. Before I introduce you to today's panel, I just have a few housekeeping notes that I want to share with you. Um, first, we want to know more about you and who's in the audience. So we're going to be asking you some polls throughout the program. So keep your eye on those on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so the first question we're going to ask today is, how would you characterize your business right now? We ask that every week, and we'd love to hear uh, where you are in your state of reopening. So you can answer that now or any time during the first half of the event, and we will reveal your um, results, your answers later. Uh, secondly, we will be taking audience questions later, so you can type those in the right-hand side of your screen at any point during the event. And if you see one that you like, be sure to hit the thumbs up button and upvote it uh, to move it to the top of the list. And then lastly, I would like to thank our presenting sponsor, Chase for Business, as well as our supporting sponsors, ADP, FedEx, MetLife, and Square. I would also like to thank our chamber partner, the Jefferson Chamber of Commerce, located near New Orleans, and we'll hear from small business owners from that area in today's webinar. Uh, they join us as Hurricane Laura is heading directly uh, for Louisiana and Texas, and our thoughts are with everyone there. Uh, please stay safe. So um, I'd first like to introduce you to our experts. Today we have um, Jay Bandy, president of Goliath Consulting Group, which is a restaurant consulting group based in Atlanta. And we have Ken Biberai, managing director of Savills, a commercial real estate advisory group in Washington, DC. So welcome to Ken and Jay. Ken? Yep. Hi, hi guys. How are you? Doing well, thanks for having us. Good. So Ken, I'm gonna start with you. Um, so you're advising companies uh, in, who are managing their, their operations. Uh, tell me what uh, is the most important thing for businesses to be considering as they start to bring employees back? Well, look, this is a uh, new territory for everyone as they're planning a return to the office and getting their employees back. Uh, we've kind of taken a three-prong approach, right? So today, 25 weeks in, it's good to do an assessment. Well, how have your employees managed? How has productivity been? Do they have the IT support that they've needed during their time working remotely? Then step two is really the logistics of it. What is it like to return back to the office? How many people are gonna be expected to come back? What kind of PPP, PPE situation do you need? What is the building done? How have you accommodated your space to handle uh, traffic flow? What percent of the people can come? And then phase three is really going to be a dialogue about what's the future of your office space look like. Uh, and as you're looking at leases maybe coming up in, in the next several years, what, what do you want to do to make sure you can accommodate your workforce, taking into account everything you've been through so far? Uh, so when you think about all of that, the overarching goal and objective is, is safety first, and you want to make sure your, your employees and your customers uh, are, are being taken care of and you're operating a safe work environment. Great. Okay. Hi, Jeanette. Hi. So you are a restaurant consulting group, but you also own a restaurant. Um, yes. So you're kind of looking at this from both angles. Um, with restaurants and retail businesses, right now they're operating with capacity restrictions and they're getting creative on how to maximize their space. So um, what are you advising your clients on that front? We've got several areas that we advise them on. So the first uh, piece that we look at is the business verticals they're in. You know, is it possible to do curbside? Is it possible to do takeout if you're a restaurant? You know, looking at different ways to get product out the front door and then inside the restaurant, just making sure that everything's spaced appropriately, but also that, you know, it's got good flow. Um, the second piece is, you know, just making sure that you've got a good plan. You know, you're looking at your marketing, social media is uh, wildly important now. Facebook, I don't know what the readership numbers are, but I'm guessing there's two or three times as many people using Facebook that are active and not just, uh, you know, have a membership, so to speak. So that's the, uh, that's the next piece. And then 
Third, you know, it's it's really, you know, keeping your staff and your customers safe. And so, you know, that's that's a big priority in, in making people comfortable and making sure you're given the the guest or customer service, you know, that your that your guest or you know customers expect. Yeah. So those are really the the top three. Got it. Thank you. Um, Ken, coming back to you. Um, so we're talking about customers in retail or restaurants, but this is also an employee issue. Um, and so these social distancing requirements can ch will change the whole workflow of an office. So how are you advising clients to think about just their internal processes and how they continue to get their work done while doing it safely? Yeah, I, I think what we're really focused on is ensuring almost over communication with your employees uh, to make sure you're doing surveys, gather intelligence, gather information, really approach the return to office in a way that doesn't put pressure on people, but is clear and transparent about the, the measures being taken by the building to ensure safety and the steps being taken within your office. Uh, most folks are going to have a measured return to the office until there's a full vaccine. So uh, that will allow for social distancing from the outset, right? So it's all about setting up a flow. Um, in Washington, D.C., as an example, if you're in an open bullpen situation, you still need to wear a mask. So what we're seeing a lot of companies doing is if they only have a certain percentage of folks returning to the office, they're trying to capture all of the offices on the perimeter if they have extra offices and allowing other people to, to swing into those offices so they can make calls, take the mask off, and do the work that they need to be doing. Um, you want to be transparent. You want to be clear. You want to communicate. And you also want to bring new people to the table. So often when we're advising clients on real estate matters, it's often a CFO, a president of an organization, the chief operating officer. What we're seeing a lot more of now, human resources at the table, ensuring your uh, general counsel and legal team is at the table, but also your IT team. What technology is being put into place to ensure that your data, your information, are you equipped to provide every employee with a laptop? Do they all have desktops? So a lot of this is kind of managing the entire operation and flow of a business and then creating a work environment that allows people to safely return to the office. Because what we hear from everybody uh, that we're dealing with is there's a real overarching desire to find a way to get back to the office, not to get rid of the office completely. Folks are really uh, craving the opportunity to uh, collaborate, meet with their colleagues, and really uh, get back into uh, almost a normal course of business. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, Jay, um, we're talking about employees in the office, but in terms of restaurants, a, a lot of restaurants are really focused on outdoor dining right now. Um, and that means, you know, setting up tables in places no one ever thought they would see tables, Absolutely. like parking lots and in the street. So um, do you have any sort of general guidelines for businesses? And, and it's not only restaurants. I mean, I've seen gyms doing this, like businesses that are setting up outside. Yeah, the, the move of retail and again, especially restaurants, since that's our expertise, is, you know, the first step is moving technology outside. So, you know, it's having a, you know, hopefully a way to take payment from guests uh, outside. Uh, we have clients that are setting up uh, mobile POS terminals and cash boxes in uh, tents or shelters that they've built outside the, the restaurant where that's possible. Uh, it's it's important also to look at your staffing because you you need somebody to be able to pay attention to that service area if it's in your parking lot if it's on your you know hopefully on your patio if you're a restaurant but it's also having the personnel to be able to run product in and out of the the restaurant or retail space you know is important so there's a staffing component to it uh, the other thing is is direction so you know people are changing their parking lot flows it's having good signage. And the uh, the last piece of that is, you know, also let guests know through your website and social media that you are doing takeout, that you are doing curbside. Uh, you know, we've seen people shift their businesses from being 60 or 70 percent dining or more to 60 or 70 percent uh, takeout. And, and, you know, we've got one customer that's a full service restaurant that had a big enough parking lot, they set up a drive through. So, you know, that's uh, pretty unconventional for a full service restaurant, but they haven't had the space and it's work. Their comp sales are, you know, comping along what they were doing last year. So uh, there's, you know, multiple different uh, solutions based on your location. Great. Thanks. Um, Ken, you talked a little bit about um, 
desks and using desks around the perimeter. You want to talk a little bit more about reconfiguring office space, the desks, or even the um, the meeting spaces? Yeah, it's interesting, right? So everyone will have a certain footprint in their office. And what we're trying to do is figure out how not to make dramatic uh, changes that are requiring a lot of construction. How can we utilize the footprint you have now in a way that allows to have more choice of where and how you're working? So that means taking advantage of existing offices, uh, implementing clean desk policies, making sure that people are booking offices, they have the opportunity to use a different office if they didn't have one in the past. Because we're returning to the office in a slow manner and folks are usually doing it uh, by only a certain percentage on, you know, over the coming months, that's allowing people to use offices and meeting rooms in a different way. And we expect in the future, as we think about the, the broader impact to your own office space and commercial real estate, that you're really gonna see the office kind of transform to really be a hub for, for socialization, for collaboration, for learning. And some of that heads down kind of work may be accommodated with the remote work, right? So organizations are really assessing what's the productivity, how are their employees adjusted, and what type of work they need to be in the office for and what type of work they should be at home for. So while we'll expect some more flexibility, most likely for most organizations and letting people maybe work from home a few days a week, they still see the office as a hub for allowing more of this collaboration. So in the near term, absolutely right, Jeanette. It's, it's a focus of a clean desk policy, uh, implementing social distancing within the office, similar to what Jay was saying too with the, with the traffic flow. Uh, we have you know, arrows on our floor here in our office uh, at Savills that direct people, you enter one way, you exit the other, uh, hand cleaning and sanitation everywhere. Uh, and, and it's really gonna be incumbent on employees and employers to, to be consistent because you know, as someone who's back in the office, you quickly revert back to your old tendencies pretty quickly. So it's going to be something where we're, we're all in it together and we're going to have to work collectively to, to make sure we return it back to the office. Do you think yeah. um, hot desking, which was already becoming a trend where people were sharing desks to save office space, do you think that's sort of the future? Yeah, so a lot there's a lot of uncertainty here, right? So a lot of this over-densification, there seems to be obviously a little bit of a pushback to accommodate social distancing. Uh, Eric Schmidt of Google has a contrarian view of this where some people say, you know, offices may disappear. He thinks people are actually potentially going to need more office space to accommodate social distancing. So if you had an office that was a little too dense, you're going to take advantage of the perimeter offices and the conferencing while you're in the office to accommodate uh, far enough spacing. Like you're seeing in some restaurants with partitions, you're seeing that in some offices today as well but we haven't necessarily seen the massive kind of uh reconfiguring completely of offices i think this is still in such live time and we're all easing back into the office that it's going to be uh evolving over the next couple of months right. <laughs> thank you so jay we're talking about employees and customers at the same time so for big restaurants this is a lot of change for customers and Restaurants already had a lot to communicate to their customers. Just like when right. the waiter comes to your table and tells you the 17 specials they have that <laughs> night, there's already a lot of communicating happening. So what is your advice to restaurants on how to now be also communicating all of these changes? Well, I think the uh, the the first thing to do is, is to communicate. I think people are afraid sometimes to talk about, you know, what's needed to be done. But if you look at consumer research that's been coming out the last 12 to 16 weeks, uh, it's not food quality, it's not service, it's safety is number one in the consumer's mind. So uh, it's important that that is a message that's upfront. So it should be something that's posted in the lobby, posted near the front door that talks about if you have a mask ordinance that folks need to wear a mask, but also it's taking that message and you know posting it around the restaurant posting on your website, posting on social media, actually doing posts about, you know, here are the safety measures. I've seen some people doing videos that talk about the things that they're doing. So, you know, it, it, typically we don't talk a lot about safety in restaurants. It's about the guest experience. And so, you know, we're focused on steps of service and quality of the food and the environment. But right now, people just want to be safe. Yeah. And so the good news is, is they're, they're, they're going to like the message that you're giving them and you need to be you know vigilant with it too not it's not a one and done solution sure thanks so um ken sort of the same question but on the employee side how do businesses go about communicating change to their employees and and instilling confidence it, it, this really is all about change management even though your physical office your location may not change 
the way you're using it is changing. So you want to over communicate. You want to do surveys that are anonymous. You want to make sure your employees can share uh, their frustrations with how things have worked with a remote working situation. What are their concerns about going back to the office? And you want to kind of communicate to them with some confidence that you're taking steps and holding the building accountable. So at Savills, we represent tenants. We advocate for the tenant on their behalf with the landlord when we're structuring the original deal. But even today, as we think about returning to the office. You want to make sure you're getting a full understanding of what the building is doing as it relates to filtration, cleanliness, ensuring there's PPE in the building. And uh, you want to understand all that that's happening outside of the four walls of your office. And then within your office, you want to make sure that they feel comfortable when they start returning to the office, that you've taken steps and precautions to make sure the physical interior office space uh, is, is in a, a safe environment. And so many conversations in the past. Uh, when it comes to commercial real estate, have talked about the work environment and creating some hospitality. You're going to see a lot more dialogue and discussion about wellness and air quality and how those factors are going to play in uh, tremendously into future real estate decisions as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jay, one more question for you before I introduce our small business owners. Um, you know, small businesses don't have, as our as our small business panelists will tell you, they don't have huge budgets and things are really tough right now. Just any quick tips on how they can think about being, you know, creating this socially distant situation without breaking the bank? Yes. Uh, you know, it's, it's about, you know, in the, in restaurants, it's using plexi to, you know, between the booths and there are some creative things to do in the dining room. But, you know, really when you look at your budget, it's it's just focusing your your dollars, you know, what you have, and you can reduce it on social media. Uh, definitely social media is is driving business. So, you know, TV ads and, and radio and all those things that you're doing, you know, social media is going to drive folks to your location. So I think that's the, you know, the best tip in terms of saving money is sure. uh, to shift yeah. your shift your marketing dollars. Great. Thank you. Um, so thank you both. I would now like to bring in our small business owner panel. Uh, first, we have Tommy Satanovich, the owner of Drago Seafood Restaurant in New Orleans. Um, we have Dr. Lena Joseph Ford, founder and CEO of High Level Speech and Hearing Center, and Teresa Lawrence, who is president of Delta Personnel Inc. and CEO Delta Administrative Services. So thank you, all of you. You're, they're all based in New Orleans. Um, so welcome to all of you. And Tommy, I'm going to come to you with my first question. Hello. How are you doing? Hi. So Tommy, uh, your, your restaurants are famous in the New Orleans area um, and beyond. Uh, tell us a little bit about the changes that you've had to make at your restaurants to keep your diners safe and dining at a distance. Well, I mean, it, obviously it's changes that we've made and then changes that were mandated by the state that we make. You know, we, uh, we've set up uh, all of our employees have to wear masks. We have taken a section of our parking lot as tight as parking is around here. And we've set, you know, 10 tables outside in our parking lot. Uh, when our employees come to work, we take their temperature uh, before each shift, not just once a day, but each shift. Uh, there's a questionnaire that they have to ask based on uh, symptoms and exposure and who they've been around. You know, one unique thing that we do in our restaurant, you know, we have a timer that goes off every 30 minutes. And when that timer goes off, every employee in the restaurant has to stop what they're doing, even if they're in the middle of taking an order at the table and go wash their hands. Simply tell a customer, hey guys, this is a mandate that we have. We've got to go wash our hands. I'll be right back and I'm coming right back to finish taking your order or finish servicing uh, whatever they're doing. At that time, we also you know, sanitize and wipe down all the customer touch points, the door handles, the, you know, the, uh, the bathroom faucets, uh, the push plates on, uh, on doors, anything that customers touch that we see, you know, we uh, we wipe down every 30 minutes. Uh, we do extra sanitizing at the table. We wipe down and sanitize all the tables, the edges of the tables, um, all the condiments that are on the tables. You know, the state mandates that our tables are six feet apart from each other. Uh, they mandate that we can't have tables of uh, 11 or larger, only up to tables of 10. Um, you know, we offer, if some people would like, we give them single use items. So if somebody doesn't want to use our china or our glasses, we've got single use items for them. You know, basically whatever, you know, and, and sometimes people come up with strange requests, whatever they want, we're going to try to go out of our way to, uh, you know, to take care of our customers and make them safe and our employees at the same time. Great. Thank you. 
So Lena, uh, tell us a little bit about your speech and hearing center. And I just learned from you that you not only operate the speech and hearing center, but a lot of your work is also done in school. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that and then how you've changed your operation at the speech and hearing center to bring people back safely. Sure. So, so we've been operating a speech and hearing center for about four years now, a relatively new business, I would say. Um, so, of course, we had not lived through a pandemic. Um, or, I mean, we barely lived through a hurricane like we're doing right now, right? Um, so, so being a new business and having all of these new measures um, being mandated, it was definitely something that was new for us particularly because we were so used to working with children more than adults. And as you may know, working with children, they, you know, it's difficult to, it's easy to tell an adult, okay, don't touch, wash your hands, don't sneeze on me. Um, but not so much with children, right? So I, I would say all of that has been an adjustment for us. Some things that we've decided to do um, just to make sure that we are regulating or controlling more of our environment and still being able to incorporate a lot of the uh, changes that are requirements for safety during COVID-19. Um, one of the things we've done, of course, has been implementing a pandemic policy, which we've done through the help of Delta PEO company with Teresa Lawrence, who's here today, but also um, in requiring our employees to not only wear face masks, but also face shields and to always utilize gloves, um, I mean, at, uh, before we had just a welcome sign and welcome mat at the front of the door. Now we have about three different signs about hand washing and um, do not enter if you don't have a mask. You know, these have become regular things. As soon as a patient walks in, uh, I mean, before we even say hello almost, it's like, okay, you're taking, you're checking your temperature and you're cleaning your hands with the hand sanitation stations. Um, you mentioned earlier how expensive these things are for small businesses. That's so true, but it's it's the new mandate. It's the new requirement. So um, it's really important that all small businesses continue to incorporate these things just to keep everyone safe. It's, it's very important for our health and safety. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Teresa. Hi, thank you for having me. Sure, thanks for joining us. So you are not only providing services to other businesses, but you're managing your own business. So your business has been open throughout the pandemic and your employees have been in the office, but you've had to do a lot of interesting things to make that possible. So tell us a little bit about how you changed your procedure in the office. So um, knowing that the business is dependent on what we decided to do and how we would set the pace, communication became key. Uh, quickly, we got together and we had a plan set in place and that plan uh, work for us, and I, I don't know if, if, if this could work for your businesses as well, but we designed an A and B group. So in essence, we had a group that came in, A group will come in Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and B group of employees will come in Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then the following week, we rotate. The B group will come in Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and then the A group Tuesdays and Thursday. And that worked very, very nicely, as long as we had the policies in place of cleanliness. So disinfecting and making sure that we had sanitation um, uh, pumps everywhere and every, uh, all the, the locations in the desk. We instill in our employees that although you are not using someone else's desk, someone else have, may have come by your desk and picked up a pen or picked up a paper. So every day they will disinfect when they came in phones and everything, and then when they left as well, because this way the contamination, uh, cross-contamination will be minimized. Uh, once we decided to bring the, um, the staff back, now when I started to tell you about communication being key, we continued to communicate and embrace technology as much as we could, although we were not all in the same space. So we used Zoom, FaceTime, uh, Teams, anything that was available for us to continue the communication and make sure that we will all stay in and sing in the same song at the same time. So once we decided to bring everybody back, our risk manager took upon himself to design a floor plan of the whole building for point entry and point of exiting. So there will be no cross, uh, you know, we're trying to have a counter flow. Um, so everyone would be kind of conscientious of what door they came in where to get to their desk the quickest and not have a lot of crossover. So a lot of a lot of that uh, systems were put in place by a, a wonderful Teddy Young. One of the things that he instilled in us was to make sure that 
we needed to have a culture that was comfortable to our level. Some people wanted to wear latex gloves, some people did not. So a lot of the times when you have an environment like this, you have to really be comfortable. And, 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 and once you're comfortable, then you start, you know, embracing the change. Um, so the next thing we did was remove the desks, you know, we moved them uh, further apart. We put the plexiglasses up, uh, we had a lot of guards go up. So uh, pretty much what everyone is saying, but I think that uh, the hesitation was, is it safe to come back to work? Right, okay, that's so great, thank you. So Tommy, Teresa is talking about communicating and how important that is, and you have that challenge too. So how are you communicating? You just told us all of those interesting things that you were doing, how are you communicating that to your customers? Well, obviously any way that we possibly can. Uh, you know, we're fortunate to have a fairly large Facebook footprint and social media footprint, which, uh, which helps out a lot. And, and it's the, you know, it's the one that's reasonably priced. Um, I also take every opportunity when I'm speaking to the public, whether it's a customer that's seated in my dining room, whether it's, you know, a family sitting at a table, you know, talk to them, let them know what we're doing, uh, making sure that they understand that, you know, that we take it seriously, that, you know, that, that their safety is, uh, of our utmost uh, importance, you know. Whenever I have an opportunity to do a TV interview with, you know, to be on the news or uh, or a radio interview with the local uh, radio stations, I'm always talking about some of the measures that we've taken, and and not only me, but our industry as a whole. Because as our industry does better, Drago's will do better as well. You know, uh, whether I'm at a chamber meeting talking, and you know, I, just any opportunity we have, you know, we post signs. Um, all over our restaurant with a list of all the things that we've done uh, that's you know on our Facebook page as well and, and we just drill you know all day long our safety measures we also import implore our uh, our employees look when you're out and you're talking to your family when you're talking to friends you know let them know the extra measure that we're taking you know talk about how much we have to do you know talk about how pain in the butt it is to wear that mask but you're doing it so we can have customers at our restaurant you know, to make them feel safer. You know, whatever it takes, um, we're, you know, we're, we're communicating that uh, on a very, very regular basis. And, uh, and, you know, we're fortunate, you know, in Louisiana, you know, our governor uh, has, you know, taken some pretty bold measures, you know, limited us to, you know, how many people we can handle in a party. I mean, we're, you know, we're limited to 50%. Um, so, you know, it's, it's important for us so we can get to that next stage so I can get to 75% and 100% and eventually have that full restaurant that we're used to having and, and that so that cu the customers can come in and what they're going to do is enjoy the oysters enjoy the food enjoy the you know the, the the atmosphere with their friends and not have to worry about uh the covid you know we're just really waiting and hoping to get to that point sooner yeah um just quickly you mentioned people having strange requests can you just think of one strange thing that someone has asked for well, I think for me, one of the strangest things is they want paper plates and uh, and plastic cups and single use items. Here we are, you know, we've got a great, you know, we got, we sanitize, we, we clean, we've got a great machine. We've got a very clean restaurant. You know, we're, we're very compliant with the Board of Health, you know, and they're doing that. You know, obviously some of the to-go that we do, uh, you know, because our to-go business has gone up a lot and, and you know, they're, they're wanting, you know, somebody wants to, he doesn't have a bottle of, you know, Captain Morgan at his house, so he wants us to you know, Captain Morgan and Diet Coke, put a Captain Morgan, let him take that home, you know, or, or just any, you know, all of those things. You know, we've had somebody that have asked for, you know, um, they didn't take it to their home, they were taken to their office, and they asked if we could bring, if we could let them use our plates and our silverware and our, you know, our linen roll ups, and then they would bring them back. So, you know, they, whatever the customer wants, and if it's within the guidelines, and we can do it. It's absolute. That's what the hospitality industry is all about: taking care of our customers and, and doing exactly what they want as best to uh, our ability. Right. Okay. Thank you, um, Lena. You, um, I, you know, almost every business owner I've talked to through the pandemic, no matter what industry, has been impacted by needing to go virtual. And so telemedicine was already a thing. Uh, but now I'm sure it's much more of a thing for your business. Although I'm curious how it works when you're talking about people's speech and hearing because video is not maybe the easiest way to do it. So just tell us how has technology and going virtual changed major, you know, have you used that to, in the pandemic for your business? 
Absolutely. And your answer to answer your question, yes. Um, I, I feel like we meet at least, uh, well, not feel like I know, we meet at least three times uh, in the morning before 8.30. So um, business hours for ex especially our executive team, our executive level staff have expanded um, more because now we are making sure that we're not just having those crucial conversations during the times that we're seeing patients, but really setting aside time to have conversations about the pandemic, about how it's affecting the company and being honest and forthcoming with the other executive team members and other um, members of our team, our um, other staff, just letting them know how our company is truly being impacted by the COVID-19 changes that we've had. We've been honest with our patients up front. So um, we'll tell them. I know um, one thing that was really funny was when we first incorporated virtual appointments um, into uh, what we were doing. I, I remember my first experience, it was a grandmother. And um, we called her and said, you know, hey, Miss So-and-so, we would like to have your grandson attend one of our virtual appointments. And she's like, virtual? What is that, baby? You know, and we're like, oh, it's like FaceTime. <laughs> just, uh, you know, we'll do speech and hearing. And she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I think we have Facebook to thank for that <laughs> because it made it easier to explain what the, uh, we call it telehealth, obviously, or uh, uh, telemedicine. But people prior to COVID-19 really were not taking advantage of telemedicine as much as we have to now. Now we're at a point where we're forced to take advantage of telemedicine. <laughs> Um, we've converted, so um, we have our conferences, uh, we communicate more now than we used to. So we have our conferences virtually. Now we're utilizing Google Hangout, Google Meets Hangout. Um, I, I, Y'all, if you're not using G Suite, you need to look into it. It's amazing. So much information, um, everything you need. It's just really, really everything right there on one um, dashboard, one platform for your use as a business owner. Um, so we're using that a lot, not just for uh, our individual conferences with among employees and team members or, or vendors, but also with our patients. So um, we're doing that. Um, I love what Tommy said about uh, making sure that with communication that you're um, because we don't have that face to face interaction as we once did, being able to be present in some way through social media. Um, uh, also, one of the things we did, I started a, a new segment on WWL TV, uh, Great Day Louisiana, called Healthy Habits with Dr. J. So now my patients are able to tune in every, now it's Monday, but every morning, Monday morning, Friday morning, and see my face and hear about our company. So we're constantly still being able to be um, at the forefront when it comes to the evolving medicine or evolving healthcare system here in the city of New Orleans. And finally, one of the um, least utilized tools that uh, we've been utilizing more, but I still think we can do a better job of it, and you all that are watching may agree, is utilizing the, our own websites in order to really convey information, communicate, and to handle business there. I really um, think that we can still continue to do, uh, continue to develop that uh, our website and utilizing it as a good platform for communication and virtual visits and virtual appointments and virtual conferences, virtual everything, right? Virtual parties. Right, right. <laughs> but, um, it's interesting that that's become the new normal. Now. Yes, thank you. So Teresa, coming back to you, I think the theme of the day is communicating, right? So we've talked about communicating to customers, communicating to employees. So before my last question, before we go to the audience Q&A is to you about how are you advising your clients about communicating in terms of, I know that you're, you're big on visual communication. So just tell us a little bit about that. So uh, visuals, you know, they inspire confidence. Um, uh, we learned that people see better and respond better than hear better. So I, uh, so our process is always involved making sure that our employees um, are able to feel comfortable and secure and safe. And the only way that we can do that is by showing them to, 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 to the processes that are in place to make them feel comfortable. Um, the signs, just, I think just about everybody, Tommy is, is leading the pack here because he's actually showing the safe of his environment, how, how pleasant it is to enjoy a good meal without the anxiety that, that those levels rise. So using visuals such as the posters, 
making sure you wear the mask when you, you know, we do appointments, uh, you know, we have visitors to our office by appointments only. So we, sh we show them the process. We show them that we take in temperatures. We're showing them that we're wiping down before we get to the desk with them. We wipe it so they can see us actually doing the process. Once we walk them out the, the exit in the door, we walk them to the door, we wipe the inside of, of the handle, the outside of the handle, showing the, your guests, your employees, your, 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 you know, your clients, that you have a safe environment is key to growth. If, if they're not feeling comfortable, if they're not feeling safe, and you're not able to, to provide posters of safety guidelines or exiting and entering um, bathroom washing, you know, all of those things, anxiety level becomes very, very high. And then the, the, the you know, the red, thinking over whether or not this is a place for me to to even go in starts to become the number one thing. So you wanna be as visual as you can with everything that you do in your processes so everyone is comfortable and embracing what they're to do with you, whether you're serving food or, or taking care of their hygiene, the ears. That's great, thank you so much. So I am going to take us now uh, to the audience Q&A, but before we do that, I think we want to see where our audience is in terms of reopening. So we're going to do that in real time. We've been finding lately that uh, the audience, if you're not voting, if you haven't voted yet, you can vote now. We've been finding in recent weeks that most businesses are pretty much open to some degree, which is what we see here as well, um, which is, uh, you know, obviously good news. Um, but it's interesting that they are, uh, the majority of businesses are not completely open, which means that they are dealing with exactly the things that we're talking about, right? They're, they're open, but remote, or they're partially open. And, and we don't even know what other means. But so I think that helps tell us where our audience is and, and the challenges that they're dealing with. Um, so I'm going to ask the audience for to answer a second poll question right now, and we will do that um, in real time. And our question is, where are you focusing your social distancing efforts? Um, so you can vote now and we will talk about that. It's just interesting to see. Um, oh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so everyone is really focused on both, although it's interesting that so many more are focused on their, yeah. <laughs> I'm watching a change as I'm trying to comment on it. So I think the interesting thing for us to know is that it really is both customers and employees. And I am guessing that everyone's challenges are different because you're really communicating one message to your employees and one message to your customers. So um, thank you to the audience for voting on that. Um, so now I'm going to take us to the audience Q&A. And I believe that I am going to start with Ken um, and ask. Uh, so Ken, I'm going to ask you this question. Then Tommy, get ready, because I'm going to actually ask you this same question, because this was supposed to be your question, and I didn't get to it. So Ken, I'm coming to you first. Sure. Um, in terms of your world of office space and real estate, what pandemic changes that you're seeing now about the way people operate, and we talked about this a little before, are you anticipating will sort of become permanent changes? Well, I think the overarching theme here is that COVID is an accelerant. It's really accelerated a lot of trends that maybe were percolating over time. Um, I think work from home, some version of it for all companies will continue to exist, uh, will be part of the future. Um, I think investments in technology by companies, uh, whether it's in the cloud-based solutions, laptops, infrastructure for employees, that's going to be absolutely critical, uh, especially as you're trying to make sure it's an equal environment for all of your employees. Um, not everyone has the same access to the same technology, and you're going to want to make sure your workforce has those resources. So you'll probably see big investments uh, by companies in the technology. Um, talent and recruitment is going to be something that's going to be interesting moving forward. We're talking to more and more companies that over these last five, six months have now had to make hires. And some of those hires are geographic agnostic. Uh, there are, these are companies who uh, have founders who are always focused on, you know, butts and seats for productivity and have had to adapt during this time and now realize that maybe they can have some ancillary functions uh, hired out of state in, in different pockets of the country. So you may see more of an evolution about where the employees are and how you're recruiting and retaining talent. Uh, and lastly, I think the overarching theme from our perspective is that the office isn't going anywhere. Um, despite work from home, despite some of the productivity that we've seen, 
people are going to be eager to get back to the office and to collaborate with their colleagues. And I think that's really going to be something, especially for younger workers who are going to need the mentorship, the collaboration, the socialization. And if you're an organization, you're trying to build culture, it's going to be important to still have a, a place that you can use to bring people together and promote your mission. Yeah, thank you. Tommy, um, same for you. What changes are you making in your business that you think will be permanent? Well, you know, unlike what Dr. Lena has, where she can do telemedicine, they haven't yet invite, invented uh, telesmell and teletasting. So, uh, so we can't do that. But some of the changes, you know, our business, uh, our to-go business has gone up tremendously. You know, we've, you know, we've kind of configured our menu. We've, uh, we've gone to new packaging, you know, which makes it more appealing. So customers will say, man, this was good. Let's get this again tomorrow. Or, you know, so, so the packaging, you know, uh, of the way we do to go and, and and the extra care and emphasis that we put on to go is something that I definitely see moving forward. Um, you know, we have, you know, if I could get people to sit in my parking lot right now, if I got 10 or 12 tables out there, uh, we're, we're going to put a patio up front. We've already started uh, the plans. You know, we have a piece of property around the corner that uh, we're going to tear down. We're going to turn that into a parking lot. We're going to, so we have to replace the parking that we're going to take with the seats. So uh, we're going to add a patio in front of our restaurant. It'll be landscaped. It'll be set up nice. Obviously, you know, we're in New Orleans, so we need heaters and we most importantly need, you know, fans and misters. And we'll probably put a couple TVs in there so we can watch all of our Saints touchdowns and, uh, and, and stuff like that on the TV. So we'll do a really nice patio outside. Uh, that hand washing awareness that I, you know, I talked about where every 30 minutes, maybe it's not every 30 minutes, maybe it's every time you walk through a certain door, but I, I see some sort of policy moving forward where we automatically have this extra hand washing and uh, sanitizing and, you know, customer touch points that we're going to be, you know, wiping and cleaning. Um, obviously, you know, if you've been in our restaurants before, our tables are very close together uh, in the past where sometimes they were, two to three feet apart. Uh, for a while now, we were, when we were at 25% occupancy, you know, our tables were 10 feet apart. You know, now our tables are six and a half feet apart. You know, once we go to phase three and phase four and, and, uh, and COVID is pretty much behind us, I probably think that Drago's, our tables are gonna be, you know, four feet apart, maybe five feet apart, you know, to make our customers feel better where, oh man, that guy next to me, you know, he's coughing or sneezing or whatever to you know, kind of put our customers at ease. The last thing I want is for a customer to walk out of my restaurant you know, after COVID and say, I'm not going back because I wasn't safe. I didn't feel safe. That table next to me, you know, they were just, it was this or that or whatever. Um, so I think our tables are gonna be further apart. And, and, and again, whatever the customers need and want, whichever way we see that, you know, we're, we're business people. And, and that's, that's, what, that's, what we, that's what we do every day. Uh, is try to do the best we can to take care of our customers, make sure that everything we do is about for the customer, and, because the better job we do, the more often they're going to come back and the more successful we're going to be. Great. Thank you, Tommy. Um, so, Jay, I have another restaurant question. This person, so this person is asking what happens with outdoor dining in the winter? So just what are some of the creative uh, ideas you're hearing? Yeah, that's going to be a big challenge, especially in, in colder climates, you know, where winter's winter, you know, living here in Atlanta, we uh, we might see snow every couple of years. And, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the things I'm surprised about is I did a I did a survey uh, two years ago. We were working on a outdoor restaurant here in Atlanta that was going to be mostly outdoor. And people are good to do 45 or 50 degrees outside, which is good news if there's heaters. Uh, for outdoor dining. So that's some good news uh, that I can share, uh, you know, just some, through some research we did. But, you know, if if you haven't looked at your menu now, and again, you, you know, you're feeling pretty good and you are getting people to eat outside. I think one of the things is really to look at, you know, things that were successful back in March and April, you know, bundling meals, family meals, you know, making sure your packaging, right, making sure your food travels well, because survival is still going to be you know, if if dining, you know, dining rooms are closed come winter, you've got to have a way for people to feel comfortable about getting, getting your food through delivery services. And I think that, you know, is something that there's time to work on that between now and, you know, when fall and winter hits. 
depending on where you're located, that would be the thing I would work on right now is if you haven't made that pivot to uh, to take out in a big way and deliver in a big way, now's the time to, to do that work. Yeah, I would imagine whoever owns the inflatable igloo company is uh, experiencing a serious <laughs> spike. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's see. I, uh, Lena, mm -hmm. this, you mentioned kids and how difficult they are, and I know for sure they are. Um, this person's asking in general, not just about kids, how to enforce social distancing and, um, you know, be polite and keep your customers happy, but also get them to follow the rules. Sure. So, so um, the interesting thing about kids, um, we thought that we were going to have a huge uh, issue with getting them to buy into the idea of wearing masks. So we, like I mentioned before, we work a lot with schools, we work with daycare centers. And interestingly enough, the more conversations that we had with the daycare owners, they continue to express to us that it was the adults that were actually having more difficulty keeping their mask on than the children. <laughs> so, um, and I, I believe that's because kids are neuroplastic. They're, um, they have neuroplasticity, which means that their brains can easily adjust. So I think um, getting the children to buy into the idea of wearing masks has actually been much easier than getting adults. So if the majority of your customers are kids, you're good, you're good to go. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, but in, in addition to what you're saying, um, I think uh, the important thing is helping the employees and customers, we call them patients, really understand the importance of social distancing. I, I think um, any way that you can actively engage them in it, if it's through education, if it's through signage, if it's through, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe a contest, hey, let's do a, a who wears the most uh, creative mask, face mask, you know, that that's an idea. Um, to continue to get customers or patients to engage and to um, buy into the idea of wearing masks, social distancing. Um, you know, there's so many other things we can do virtually. It, it, just going into the whole virtual uh, concept, it has not only, well, I know for my business for sure, it has not only created a, a, an additional source of revenue for us, but it's also allowed us to have increased access to even more of a customer base. So now, whereas transportation really limited us, now we don't have those barriers of entry where um, before we were really strong advocates of getting people access to medical care. Now these virtual appointments and uh, social distancing has actually made it an okay thing to do um, in this new new society that we have. Great, thank you so much. Teresa, um, this person says with the rotating schedules, I don't know if you had two groups or three, but how did that work with employees who had various family obligations? Um, you know, how do you get, how did you handle that? So we had um, the A and B group, we had two groups. Um, we still have people working from home. Um, I think it was probably March 22nd or 24th that we had our last in office where the whole staff was there and the decisions were made at that point to make sure we had everybody aware of what the changes were going to be in our plans. So we communicated to the staff, everybody grabbed their phones and their, and their uh, you know, working whatever was needed to, for them to work from home. Because at this point, all we had created was a rotation schedule of A and B. Um, so to tell you the truth, um, a lot of our meetings were held virtual almost daily uh, and FaceTime, we were not pressed to make anyone come. But we did certainly count on the leadership teams of each of our departments to be present uh, and be involved in our A and B group uh, at the very beginning. And then little by little, we started incorporating the rest of the staff to start, you know, I think that the hesitation and the, and the uh, anxiety was because it, it was such a shock that was happening. We wanted to make sure that whatever we were going to do, we were going to establish an environment where they would be comfortable returning and coming back. Uh, the children did become a challenge because they were out of school as well. So we did not want to have a situation where they felt they were exposing themselves to, and then bring it at home. So building all these layers, building all these blocks to make sure that we had a very good 
controlled environment when they came in and when they left and making sure they were working up the right amount of time, you know, because we never wanted uh, to, to be in a situation where I'm not going to be able to make enough time if they were hourly employees, you know, so we, that rotation was very conscientious. Um, our operations manager, Jody, was in daily hourly, I would say, contact with each of our team uh, and making sure that everyone was communicated properly and that every questions that of anxieties were brought up, we make sure we had answers that we were able to bring about to everyone in the group and not just to that specific person. So basically when there were things that would rise up, she made sure that every, this question came up, this is what we're gonna do about it. So it was really, um, you know, it was it was the unknown, but it's our culture that, that kind of overrode everything because of, of the communication skills that we have, but staying in touch with them is key. Great. And, <clears throat> Thank you, Teresa. Um, Tommy, this person is asking, uh, what is your best advice for business owners looking to keep their operations moving even while social distancing? I think you're uniquely qualified to answer that because you're doing it in such a public way. Yeah. Well, one thing, don't let a difficult customer influence or compromise your social distance uh, rules and regulations, whether it's your company rules or whether it's you know state guidelines that you're following. Because if you let a difficult customer say, well, you know what, I don't care. We're, gonna, we're not going to wear a mask. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. You know, um, you might be upsetting two, three, four other groups of customers that may, uh, that may be nearby, especially when, you know, the, you know, when you're on a wait with customers. But I got to tell you, most of our customers, when, you know, when either myself or one of our managers approach you know, a customer or a group, can you please put your mask on or can you pull it all the way up? Or uh, when you're going to, can you go back to the table and get your mask before you go to the bathroom? Uh, can You know, 99% of the people that we talk to and remind, they say, oh, sure, we're going to take care of that. And they do it. So don't be intimidated by a customer when you see them, you know, come without a mask or not complying. Sometimes they're not complying because they just don't know. And if they're not complying because they're just being a hard butt, well, you know what? Just you need to ask them to leave because you got more people in the restaurant that are concerned about their safety and our employees' safety. And uh, don't compromise. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, Lena, you also want to address that, just the mask thing, but also like how do you deal with people who are not following the rules? Yes, absolutely. So um, we actually have had to turn away a few people. Um, number one, uh, the first first I'll say the first three turn turnarounds, if you will, uh, that we had to make uh, for our patients were due to high fevers. We had a couple of kids and uh, some family members that came in that had high temperatures. This was like when COVID was just really um, uh, surfacing over in the uh, New Orleans area. And um, I mean, I mean the. I, I did train my front office staff, uh, who to me are the gatekeepers, your receptionists, your secretaries. Um, you know, those are the gatekeepers for entry. And um, we just trained them in how to politely turn someone away. And um, just like Tommy said, they 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 really didn't have an issue with um, not co with complying. We it was it was relatively easy for us to get them to comply. Um, I think if you have a staff who really sets the example, and if you post your signage outside of the door, so as soon and the expectation that you set right for your employees and your your uh, customers becomes okay. Hey, if you're if you're not this is the this is the expectation. This is the criteria. This is the requirement. Requirement. If you set that expectation from the get-go, I think that'll reduce a lot of uh, possible issues or contention that you may have due to the mask wearing from um, folks. Because here in New Orleans, honestly, y'all, there there are some people who are not, they don't believe in social distancing. They don't believe in wearing masks, okay? That, that's just the culture. Teresa mentioned it earlier. It, it's it's just the culture that we have here in New Orleans. Um, but But Part of our culture is also uh, being uh, that Southern hospitality, um, kindness. So I think that um, if we show people that respect and that kindness up front, then we'll reduce the chances of having any type of really major issues develop due to the mask wearing. Yeah, thank you. Ken, um, I'm gonna come to you with that same question. Just any advice on how to deal with customers who aren't compliant with whatever aspect it is of 
Well, we're, we're starting to see it more so on the office side now as we're uh, taking clients out to go tour spaces, visit buildings. Uh, landlords are being very proactive about it and putting signage up. I mean, they're almost in the hospitality business themselves now. As you enter an office lobby, it's like entering a restaurant. They were being very proactive about encouraging everyone to wear masks, limiting the number of people in elevators. So it's really changing how the commercial brokerage uh, business is working. We're doing a lot of tours virtually first, but when we narrow down the buildings, we have to go in person. And each of these buildings knows that there's a spotlight on them uh, for the tenant in question. And every landlord nowadays is very focused on winning tenants and getting them in their buildings. So they're going to go above and beyond to make sure that there's very clear protocols about how they're handling uh, the mask situation and safety in building. So I think on the office side, uh, everyone's taking it you know, pretty seriously right now, especially as they're thinking about getting their own employees back to the office. Thanks. Tommy, I'm coming back to you for what I think might be our last question. I might be able to get one more in. So the audience, someone's asking, and I've had this experience myself, how, so if you go into a store or a restaurant or anywhere and the workers aren't wearing their masks properly, so they have it on, but it's not covering their mouth or it's not covering their nose, and you as the customer feel uncomfortable, they're asking, how would you, as the restaurant owner, have the customer address it with the employee? Like, should they address it with the employee directly? Should they go to the manager? Like, what's the best way to handle that so it doesn't become a thing that ruins your dinner? Whatever works the best and the fastest to satisfy the customer. Whether, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, you, I have no problem with a customer saying, hey, can you please wear your mask up or can you have it a little tighter? If a customer came to me and said, you know what? That, that waiter, his mask is kind of open a little bit. You know what, ma'am? We'll take care of it. I'm going to get a new waiter on the table right away. Take that waiter off on the side. Say, look, you got to wear your mask. Give them other tables and, and, and teach them. And, and, you know, one of the things uh, that I, I wanted, you know, New Orleans, the metro area here, we were one of the hot spots in the country for the longest time because of Mardi Gras and, and, and the festivities and, and the closeness uh, early on in February this past year. You know, New Orleans became a hot spot really, really fast. I'm going to tell you the mayor of New Orleans made some very, and our governor made some very unpopular decisions and, uh, and rules. But one thing you can't argue with, they worked. Masks work. As much as I hate wearing a mask, they work. And New Orleans now went from being one of the worst hotspots in the country to being one of the best places in the country because our people listened and our people followed instructions. And yeah, you're going to get one or two knuckleheads that are not going to listen, but that's everywhere. But for the most part, the people in this city and this metro area have listened. And, and now we have some numbers that we're proud of. And, and if you look at the graphs and the numbers in you know our positive cases now, they, they're just plummeting right now. And, you know, our hospitalizations are way down. Our ventilators are way down. You know, deaths are, you know, are, are way down. So, you know, we're definitely on the right track. Obviously, we're going to get a little bit of a bump now that school starts, but, uh, but it's going to go back down. And it's because the people, for the most part, are listening. One or two knuckleheads, there's nothing you can do about those guys. Yeah. Thank you. Teresa, I have just one minute left to, to get this answer. For, this is a lightning round for you. Um, just I know that you have feelings about the, the need to have a policy in place that helps enforce this. So can you give us your one minute take on what, what people need to do to make that happen? So you need to create a COVID-19 policy for your handbook. Uh, COVID-19 is, is just as new to you as it is to the business. So if, if you could get with an HR manager to create a policy and make sure you're very um, circular about it, uh, the mask, the distancing, uh, and, and what it is, what will cost them not, you know, you have to have a reaction to an action. So if this does not done, this could be, you know, this is warning number one, number two, you follow it just like you do all your policies, um, but put that in place. A lot, of, a lot of employers forget that they don't have that in place. So when they are faced with a confrontation or a situation that I want to go travel, like a travel policy, COVID travel policy, um, you know, whether you're going by plane, by car, what, is, whether, what do you want to do with that? If they're going by plane, do you need to quarantine them? Do you, you know, all of those things, um, I think the employers forget that there, would, there is no policy, there is no base, and there is no backup um, to, 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 the, to that process. So that's new, and we need to have all the uh, companies rethink their position and make sure they put that in their handbook and implement that as part of, of the policy moving forward until things change. 
I think that is excellent advice and a great place to end it today. Um, so I want to thank all of you, uh, Jay, Ken, Tommy, Lena, and Teresa, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Chase for Business, as well as our supporting sponsors, ADP, FedEx, MetLife, and Square. And thank you to our chamber partner, the Jefferson Chamber of Commerce. It has been great to hear from business owners in that region today. And most of all, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us. Please join us again. Um, Wednesdays every other week. So in two weeks on Wednesday, September 9th, where we will be discussing how companies can reshape their brands for a post COVID world, which can't come soon enough. <laughs> in the meantime, yeah. Check out the great resources that are available uh, on this webpage from the US Chamber and our presenting partner Chase for Business. Together, we will recover and rebuild. See you next week. And thanks, everyone. Bye bye.